Good morning. Welcome to Mercy Village Church. Uh, everybody just sit over here on this side if you can. We'll just just move every... I'm joking. Uh, you guys are special too. I, I feel this is random. This is like behind the scenes. But like as a, as a preacher, you try to make eye contact with everybody or at least pretend like you are making eye contact with everybody. So if it looks like the preacher's not looking at you today, just... You know, there's just more faces over here. Uh, we're happy you're here. Glad you made it out uh, today. Hopefully everybody had a safe trip here, and we'll have a safe trip on the way back. We have a few announcements just to start. Safe Space is a ministry of Mercy Village Women. Uh, Mercy Village Women. It will meet this Thursday at 6 p.m. right here in this space. Um, this will just be a kickoff kind of gathering uh, and kind of a look at what's coming this year. But this group meets just for safe, authentic conversations about all sorts of different things with Jesus at the center. Everything from, from mental health to motherhood to grief to all the different things that you could imagine. And uh, they'll share with you, I think, I don't want to speak for anybody, but I think that, that this meeting... This Thursday, they'll share with you what's upcoming this year, and then it'll just be a time of refreshments uh, and fellowship. So if you're, uh, especially if you're new with us, some of the most welcoming women I've met in my life, you will need to feel comfortable here uh, if you come out Thursday evening at 6 to be a part of that. And then the group is next Wednesday, not this Wednesday, but the next. And all the details about all that stuff is on the back of your uh, bulletin or that half sheet of paper that you received on the way in. Uh, fill out a connect card if you're new with us or if you've only been coming for a few weeks but you're looking for ways to connect, you'd like to be on our uh, email list. Those are at the connect desk in the lobby and you can take a free coffee mug with you in return for your email address and all the spamming of you that we will do. Kidding. Our email, our weekly email is actually called the Mercy Village, and then in parentheses, I-R, and then the word regular, the Mercy Village irregular, because it doesn't necessarily go out every week like it's supposed to, but that's because I'm in charge. So, Stephanie, are you going to welcome us this morning, and we'll prepare to worship Jesus together. Thank you. Luke 14, 21 through 23 says... Then the master said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. Welcome to a space filled with jacked up people saved by grace. Jesus sought us where we were. Jesus found us on the streets and the back roads. Jesus came to us on the highways and in the ditches. And there Jesus bid us come and feast with him. We are the poor whom Jesus welcomed into his richness. We are the broken whom Jesus welcomed into his healing. We are the blind whom Jesus welcomed into his light. And now we welcome you today regardless of where you are or who you are, and we bid you come and feast with Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie. We are saved by Jesus. It's written over here. It's also on your half sheet of paper, your bulletin, our vision for Mercy Village Church. We are saved by Jesus to walk with Jesus together in worship towards our neighbor and to the ends of the earth throughout generations for all our days. We're going to open in prayer before we sing. Uh, we're going to spend just a minute in uh, just a little bit of silence. And what's great is that it won't be true silence because all our kiddos are in here. And, and we uh, appreciate, I mean, actually love that. I'm serious. It, doesn't, it can come off sarcastic, but we're thankful for the families and for the children in this room. But just to pause for a second, reflectively prepare Release, if you need to, the rush or anxiety of this day or this week or the frustrations or whatever it is in this moment, and then I'll pray for us.
Just about 20 seconds of, of silence. Just breathe. Father, meet us here today, please. I don't know everyone's situation, but you do. I don't know everyone's anxieties, but you do. I, I don't know everyone's pain points, but you do. I don't know what everyone's grieving, but you do. And on the flip side, I don't know what everybody's celebrating, but you do. I don't know what everybody is excited about, but you do. I don't know what miraculous things everyone has seen this week, but, but you do. And, and that makes you exactly who you claim to be, the person who can meet us wherever we are with exactly what we need. And so I pray that you do that in this space today. That as the word of God is opened and proclaimed and sang and celebrated in communion, that you would meet us in this place with the real presence of yourself and give to us all that we need for today and for the days to come. It is the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you stand with us? My name is Josh, one of the pastors here. We're glad that you're with us today on this cold Sunday morning. Uh, we are gathered today to make much of Jesus. We're going to start by singing together. This is probably the only time this week that you will do this. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you gather with people and sing all the time. But we, uh, we do this together because we want to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done, who He is, who we are, our need for Him. Uh, and so we do this by singing these songs that, that remind us of the promises of God and the promises that He's kept, and the ones that He's made that we've not yet seen come true. Uh, but we do this, and we say this to one another, and we sing this to one another. And so before we start, we're going to sing this, re- or we're going to say this responsive reading. I'll say the first part, and we'll read the bold together. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good For his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in tents of the righteous. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Jesus was rejected by the world, but God has made him the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God. I will worship you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Together. There is a true order than the ages. There is a promise of things yet to come. And there is one born for our salvation, Jesus. Come on, church. There is a light. That overwhelms the darkness There is a kingdom That forever reigns And there is freedom From the chains that bind us And Jesus Jesus Who walks on the water Who speaks the sea, who stands in the fire beside me, he roars like a light, he bled as the lamb, he 
carry my healing in his hand, Jesus. There is a name I call in times of trouble. There is a song that comforts in the night. There is a voice that calms the storm that rages. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on My Savior, there is power in your name, and you're my rock and my redeemer, and there is power in your name.
shore in the middle of the war you guard my soul and you alone are the anchor when my sails are torn your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm when the test comes in and the doctors say I've only got a few months left It's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing I can barely take a breath And when an illness wrecks my baby girl And there's nothing I can do My only hope is to trust in you I trust in you Come on church In the eye of the storm you remain in control in the middle of the storm. You guard my soul, and you alone are the anchor. When my sails are torn, your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You remain in control in the middle of the storm. You guard my soul. And you alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm Amen. Isaiah 55 reminds us, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let's sing this next song as a prayer. God will turn our hearts Turn our eyes to him this morning. Oh, so are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free through death. And 
Thank you today for Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. Your mercy on us. Thank you for your grace. God, thank you for Jesus and his righteousness that you've given us. God, I pray if anyone in here does not know Jesus today, reveal truth as your scripture is, as your word is taught. God, stir in us, Holy Spirit, and stir affections for God that we will see Jesus for who he truly is in the midst of hard, difficult life. God, one day we'll be with you forever. Draw us close to you today. Help us to feel your presence in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's greet one another. Can we greet one another and welcome somebody? Say hello to someone you may not know this morning. All right. Uh, take your time. It's fine. We, we've kind of this in-between space when parents are taking their kids to the class and uh, everybody's kind of fellowship. We've, we've chosen to use this time in our service to remember some of our partners in prayer. Uh, we've got two, two partners we're going to talk about today. The first is through Harbor Network. So we partner with two church planting networks. One is Harbor Network. One is Send Network. Both of them are working to see churches planted um, all over North America. Through Harbor Network, we know uh, JB and Jesse Van Hoogen. What a great name. He actually played defensive back at Boise State, and then God called him to stay, and they planted a church there in Boise, 
Idaho. That is his wife, Jesse, and their kids. Listen to these names. You think, I mean, all of us should just go home and rename our kids. Uh, Bear, that's pretty tough. Hank, Gus, and then Louie. Poor Louie. He, right? He's going to have a complex, but that's fine. I'll talk to JB about that the next time I see him. Uh, he didn't consult me about the name. We're going to pray for them, and they're, they are within the first year of the church plant, uh, Boise Gospel Church there in Boise, Idaho. We're going to pray for them. We're also today thankful for Ascend Network. I was not supposed to be here this weekend. I was going to go to one of our churches, a church that is looking to pick us up for support in 2024, and I was going to preach there, but the weather had different ideas. But since I'd already gotten Dr. Danny Rumpel to fill in, for me today, I said, well, I haven't sat and listened to a sermon in like three years, so it'd be really nice to do that anyway. And then my wife was like, we'll even get to sit together in church for the first time in who knows how long, but she is working with the kids today, so <laughs> it didn't work out. Shout out to all our kids ministry volunteers, by the way. But our connection to Danny Rumpel is through the SEND Network. The SEND Network is planting churches all over uh, North America. Danny has been more than just a, what, what is your title even? It, it used to be like a CPC, Church Planning Catalyst. Okay, so, but he's also a pastor at Cross Lanes Baptist Church, and, and more importantly, at least to me, he's been a dear friend to me and to my family. Um, and so it is nice to have, the, the SIN Network does more than infuse money into our church plant and into other church plants. Uh, they infuse encouragement. Uh, compassion, uh, training, teaching, and authentic conversation. And so he's going to bring the word for us today. He has in the past as well. Um, I've never been here when he's been here, so I'm excited to be a part of this today. So we're going to pray for both Boise Gospel Church and for uh, Danny and for Send Network. And then Coach DeRose is going to prove once again that he still knows how to read. We're all... (laughs) It'll taper off at some point, I'm sure, (laughs) but uh, as of now, he still can. God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for partnerships in the gospel. Thank you for networks like Harbor Network and Send Network that have made their focus, their primary focus, seeing churches planted so that people who are lost and far from God might hear the truth of the gospel and be saved so that people who have been following you can be catalyzed to be disciples in the context that they find themselves where they live and work and play. Thank you for Danny Rumpel. Thank you for his friendship. Thank you for his kindness. And thank you for his hard work uh, to be a part of what Send Network is doing. I pray that you infuse him with strength as he delivers the word to us today. And we thank you for Boise Gospel Church, for JB and Jesse and and the boys and the work that you are doing there. I pray you provide for them everything that they need and that you grow that church for the glory of God and the fame of Jesus. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, Paul. What's this word right here? I don't know. All right. Our scripture reading is from uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Amen. Well, I am glad to be with you guys today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for... uh, let me come and, and share the word. We're, you're already there, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. I'll be there very, very soon. Um, it's a good crowd for such a cold morning. <clears throat> I'll tell this real quick. When we lived overseas, 
We lived in a, an area that was extremely tropical, very warm. Today, the high there is 79. Uh, it's sunny, uh, blue skies. It's pretty much that way all year round. We lived there for 10 years. There were people that lived up in the northern part of the area where we were. They lived in Mongolia. We called them the frozen chosen. Um, <laughs> It was cold there in the winter times. We did not want to be there. And I would, I would regularly talk to my wife and how grateful I am that we don't live in a place where it gets below freezing. Um, and then God called us back to come here. And it's below freezing. And so um, when, when a group this good meets on a morning this cold, you got a couple of things going on. One, either you're like the really born-again people or you're the really legalistic people. Um, if you're really legalistic, hopefully the gospel will like work on you this morning. Uh, there is reason to be here, uh, and I'm glad that you are. So uh, let me pray for us, and then we're going to jump in. Let's pray, God. Um, we love you. God, thank you that we can sing those songs. God, that we can think on and meditate and, and worship and praise you because you're with us all the time, whether it's sunshine or, God, whether it's stormy. God, you don't abandon us. That, that's exactly the opposite of the gospel. God, I think just... A few weeks ago, we're celebrating how you sent your son and he came down and lived among us so that he might save us. And God, we celebrate and, and we say thank you for that. God, that we can be your people and that we belong to you. God, that your grace has changed our lives God, we can be your disciples. And I pray as we, we read your word this morning that we would understand that a little bit better, what it means to be your disciple, what it means to live in your kingdom. God, to be uh, your people. So God bless us. Uh, help me not to mess anything up. Um, give us a good time in your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Matthew five thirteen through sixteen. I'm going to read it. We're going to. What I'm thinking about this morning is disciples live differently. So disciples live differently. I know you guys are working through uh, it. The the Sermon on the Mount uh, last week. The Beatitudes uh, this week. Salt and light. What does it mean to be salt and light? Um, Jesus' disciples are different because Jesus is different. And his, his kingdom is different from the kingdoms of this world. And as we read through this Sermon on the Mount, we're going to see that there's almost this upside-downness to his kingdom, right? Where he's calling us to love our enemies. Uh, Jesus teaches that the first will be last and the last will be first. I was thinking about this. Uh, probably a lot of uh, Cincinnati sports fans love that aspect of the gospel, right? <clears throat> um, I, <laughs> I try to pull for the Cleveland Browns, so I'm right there with you. Um, but, but Jesus is going to tell us to turn the other cheek. What does it look like, and how can we be empowered to live out that kind of life? He's going to talk about the kingdom of heaven. Actually, as he began to preach in Matthew 4, uh, and he sends his disciples out later to preach. He's going to say, preach about the kingdom of heaven, that it's come. God's kingdom reflects his rule and reign in this world, especially in the lives of his followers. God's kingdom also reflects his character. Because, because God is holy, there is justice and righteousness. Because he is loving, there is compassion and grace and faithfulness to all generations and all peoples. Because he has created us in his image, there is forgiveness and reconciliation and transformation back into that image. Romans 8, 29, beautiful passage 
says that we're being transformed into the image of the Son. Right? We're being created, recreated to look more and more like our big brother Jesus. And so as we read through the Sermon on the Mount, we want to understand what Jesus is saying so that we can continue to be changed into the disciples, the people that he wants us to be. As I read through this sermon, I hear Jesus interpreting the law, the Old Testament, what it means to be in relationship with God. I was thinking, this is thousands of years of Old Testament history coming to fulfillment as Jesus teaches this message. It's beautiful. The kingdom is beautiful. And as we read through this section of the Sermon on the Mount, we want to see that beauty and that wonder come alive. So let me read for us. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We're going to look at two ways that disciples live differently from this text. I told Pastor Paul I tried my best to dig three points out, but I could only get two. So this is not your typical Baptist sermon. I apologize for that. Um, Two ways. I'll, I'll state those two, and then I'll jump back in with the with the first one. The first way that we're going to see is disciples have a beneficial influence on human relationships. Disciples have a beneficial influence on human relationships. And the second will be this. Disciples have a public witness that reveals Jesus. Disciples have a public witness that reveals Jesus. The first one, disciples have a beneficial influence on human relationships. This is verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how can it be made salty? So maybe you say, well, the disciples have a a beneficial influence on human relationships. That sounds a little bit weak. That's not very, like, strong gospel-centered stuff. And I'll say this. You know, maybe, what about the take up your cross stuff, man? What about the die to yourself? Well, we're going to get there. Um, We're going to get to martyrdom and flames in a little bit. So, Um, enjoy the easy stuff for a minute. You're going to crawl before you walk, right? Salt, when Jesus talks about salt here, obviously the the crowd that he was talking to and his disciples would have known what salt is. Salt is essential for human life. Now, while Jesus isn't teaching a biology class or a chemistry class, or if you're really a science or a biochemistry class, right? Um, He is making the point If salt is essential for human life, the disciples are to be no less essential to the well-being of human life. When he talks about earth here, he's not really talking about the ground. This isn't an agricultural metaphor. This is about life. This is about people, and this is about relationships and how we interact with others. So think about that as we process through this salt. Um, There's two things that salt does, particularly back then, what it would have done. One is it enhances flavor. The other is it it preserves food or it preserves meat. This idea of enhancing flavor, if you'll notice in in Colossians 4, 5, and 6, I'm going to read it. You maybe want to take a note of it. As disciples of Jesus, who are to be the salt of the earth, and we're called to enhance whatever space we fill, what does that look like? I think one of the ways that we do that is through wise words. The things that we say, as this, it matters. Here's what Colossians 4, 5, and 6 says. Paul's writing this. He says, act wisely toward outsiders, making the most of the time. Let your speech Always be gracious, and he says, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you should answer each person. We want to have a certain kind of flavor uh, whenever we interact with others. Uh, We want to be wise. 
We want to be good stewards of the, the time and the opportunities that God's given us in the world and the relationships that we have with people. And we want our speech to be gracious, to be kind, seasoned with salt. We want it to have flavor so that you may know how you should answer each person. Paul's writing that in the context. There was some heresy. There was some struggle in Colossae. There were people that were opposing the teaching of the gospel. So he wasn't just saying this in like a kumbaya moment. He was saying this in a, it's difficult out there, and I want you to speak wisely. I want you to speak graciously. Let your conversations be seasoned in a beneficial and helpful way. James talks about the power of the tongue for good or for evil. And we want to make sure the things that we say and the way that we act with others, it enhances for the good. How do we do that? Sometimes it's really simple, guys. Um, Have you ever found yourself saying something and it it just, it's out there and it's like that toothpaste, right? When it gets out of the tube, it can't go back in. And you wish, though, that you could just hide it. Right? Can we get the rug up here and sweep that under there before anybody sees it? Sometimes it's when we're interacting with others, just say thank you to people. One of the things, this is, think about salt. So when we talk about salt and light, we talk about beneficial human relationships. I want you to think in context of not just the world where you live and the people you interact with at work. Think about the people you interact with at home. One of the things that, that these social scientists and marriage counselors, Christian marriage counselors too, say is key to solid, edifying relationships at home is couples who have gratitude for one another. So whenever I'm interacting with my wife and she makes me a... My favorite thing is peanut butter and jelly, right? That's pretty simple, guys. Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. How easy? Oh, okay, that's peanut butter and jelly. That's not a big deal, right? I better say thank you, right? How easy. So, so just letting there be simple, gracious language that we use, salting the conversations that we're in. I'll tell you another word. This is not an easy one. Um, I'm sorry, right? I was, I was working with a group of kids when I was in college at a, a YMCA day camp. I was doing a devotional. I was trying to teach them the importance of just simple words that will bring healing to relationships and that are helpful whenever you're interacting with others. And I was talking about there's, this, there's two words that we want to learn. I kept talking about these two words. I'm trying to, right, trying to build it up so the kids are excited. They're thinking about what are the two words. And, and I said a little bit of this. I said a little bit of that. And I'm almost going to tell them what the two words are. And one of the kids raises his hand. He says, I know what the two words are. I'm like, okay, I was, I was excited. Like, these kids are following along, right? I said, well, what are the, what are the two words? He said, hakuna matata. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, that's not bad, right? Uh, I'm sorry, right? If, if you've sinned against someone, a salt of the earth person is going to say, I'm sorry. They're going to come and ask for forgiveness. Uh, we were talking earlier about watching The Chosen, uh, I just, we're, we're reviewing it and then reviewing it again, right? And we watched where Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he's talking about being reconciled to others. And then that scene where Matthew goes to Mary Magdalene and asks her for forgiveness and the healing that takes place, that's salt of the earth kind of stuff. Asking somebody how they're doing and like really meaning it, right? We, that's typical, kind. hey man, how's it going? Um, And then we've kind of passed by. But but ask that question and really mean it. Interact with people in a beneficial way. Ask somebody if you can help them. And then, if they say yes, (laughs) find a way to jump in and help. Salt of the earth, beneficial relationships. Another thing that salt does is it preserves food. It preserves meat. It helps prevent corruption, Right? So as we interact with others and we're in relationship with people, don't be somebody who tears down. Be somebody who builds up. That's the question is, how can I edify? How can I bring life into this relationship, this situation? I want to be a person who unifies. 
I don't want to be a person who divides. Right? I want to be a per- this is simple. I want to be a person who's nice. I don't want to be a person who's mean. And you say, well, that's, is that in the Bible? I believe it is. If, if we're filled with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, that's what God calls us to. I want to be a person who's fair, just. I don't want to be a person who's biased. I don't want to be a person who's prejudiced. I want to be a person who loves others. Right? I don't, I don't want to be a person who's selfish and always looking at myself. We want to be people who edify, who build up. We, we do not want to be people who are corrupt. It says here, and this is, this is an interesting statement, but if the salt should lose its taste or if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty? Unsalty salt... Is a, is a contradiction, right? It's like water that's not wet. It's absurd. It just doesn't happen. And what Jesus, I believe, is saying here is uh, it doesn't make sense. And such is the disciple who has lost his distinctive witness in the world. We have nothing to contribute. If I'm not building up, if I'm not edifying and being kind and helpful, I'm a disciple who's absurd. I'm a disciple who makes no sense, and I need to repent of that. Salt from the Dead Sea was seldom pure. The disciples would... Know, so when we open our salt can, right, it's, it's, it's just white. It's clear. Occasionally, I'll open it. I'll see some little black spot in there. I'm like, Ugh. like I, don't, I don't want to put that on my food. Um, well, their salt would have had a whole lot more impurities in it. The disciples would have understood the uselessness of salt so corrupted by other minerals that you couldn't even taste the salt. It says there that it's lost its taste. It's kind of like, remember when you, you've got a, a Coke, a bottle of Coke in the fridge, right? You open it up, you take a drink, you put the lid back on it, you put it in the fridge, and you forget about it for a couple of days. And you're like, oh, I'm, we're about to have pizza. I remember I got some Coke in the fridge, and so I'm going to go get that Coke. And you open it up, and what happened to the Coke? It's flat. That's what this, that word basically means. And do you want to drink that? Well, if you have a choice, do you want to drink that flat Coke? You're not going to do it. Um, it's another translation for that word could be foolishness. So what Jesus is saying there is, don't be a flat disciple. Don't be a tasteless disciple. Don't, don't be a foolish disciple who doesn't know how to benefit the space that you're filling up, whether that's at home. Uh, Pastor Paul just prayed, where we live, where we work, where we play, how are we being salt of the earth? <laughs> Love your neighbor. That's what it looks like. Walk in the Spirit. That's what it looked like. I was thinking about this love your neighbor, and we know the, the story that Jesus told in Luke about the good Samaritan, right, who had compassion on that one that needed compassion. And it reminded me of a, of a family, a good friends of ours. They are fostering a little girl um, that was abandoned. No, I, you, you say, I was, nobody, nobody wanted her. But that's not true, right? Um, Jesus wants her. Uh, and my, my friend wanted her. And so they, they took her in. They're fostering to adopt. Actually, they were supposed to adopt last week, but the weather closed the courthouses. Ugh. Anyway, uh, it's going to happen. She has Down syndrome. She has health complications because of that. And last spring, she was in the hospital for about a month. My friend and his wife have three other children that are older. When I say older, I mean they're two, four, and six. Um, and I'm watching this family care for this little girl. And I'm thinking about the benefit 
that they're bringing, the love that they're bringing to this situation and the life that they're bringing to this situation because of Jesus, right? And now there's this little girl who would not have had a family, and instead she's got three siblings that literally fight for her attention, and she has parents that love her and will do anything for her. Now, there are a lot of examples of what it looks like to be salt-of-the-earth people. Every day, simple things we do. That's definitely one of those examples of bringing benefit to human relationship, bringing benefit to human life. When Jesus says, be salt of the earth, that's what he's saying. You need to go into spaces and, and do good. Be beneficial. Help. Love. Walk in the Spirit. That's the first point. The second point is this. Disciples have a public witness that reveals Jesus. Disciples have a public witness that reveals Jesus. Look at verse 14. He says, You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. The public witness that Jesus calls us to. As I was thinking about that, it reminded me of that 1983 song by Rockwell. Does anybody know what it is? Somebody's watching me? Come on, guys. Uh, YouTube it. Uh, it's a classic. Um, it's actually not that great. But anyway, um, I, I remember it. Anybody, any other 80s kids? Uh, people? Yeah, there we go. Um, light of the world. To a degree, the disciples of Jesus, we share this quality with Jesus, right? We know that in John chapter 8, Jesus declared himself in one of his I am statements, I am the light of the world. The disciples are commissioned to share in his ministry of proclamation and deliverance. The world needs the light, that's Jesus, and it is through the obedient, spirit-filled Spirit-led work of the disciples that this light will shine. I want to read a little bit here from Isaiah. And we can see these prophecies. When Jesus in John 8 says, I am the light of the world, he's looking back at the promises that, that were made in Isaiah. We, promises made, promises kept. That's how God works, guys. He makes a promise, he keeps a promise. You can take it to the bank. Look at Isaiah 42. We're going to read verses uh, six through eight, God says this, I am the Lord. He's, this is messianic. He's pointing towards Jesus that's coming. I have called you for a righteous purpose and I will hold you by your hand. I will watch over you and I will appoint you to be a covenant for the people, look, and a light to the nations in order to open blind eyes to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those sitting in darkness from the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. Isaiah 49 says a very similar thing. Isaiah 49 verse 6. He says, the Lord says, It is not enough for you to be my servant, Raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the protected ones of Israel, I will also make you a light for the nations to be my salvation to the ends of the earth. When Jesus says that he is the light of the world, he said there's, there's a gospel here, this kingdom. This isn't just an Israelite Jewish kingdom. This is a kingdom for all all of the nations, for all of the peoples. And his light, the light of the world, will shine out on all of the peoples. In John 1, actually, I'm going to turn there and read that too. It's too good. John chapter 1, verse 4, uh, speaking of Jesus, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not or could not overcome it. The darkness can't overwhelm the light that Jesus shines into the world. As we talk here in a little bit, 
about applying this public witness to reveal Jesus in our own life, it can be intimidating, right? The world is a scary place. The darkness doesn't overcome the light. I'm not saying it's not dangerous. I'm not saying it's not difficult. But what I am saying is that we, as the light bearers who go out to shine Jesus, we have victory in that. John 1, 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus is the one who shines the light. Jesus is the one who shines the light into the darkness. How do we apply that? Well, I'm going to turn to 2 Corinthians, actually. I'm sorry, I'm bouncing around a little bit here. There's an application for action, but there's also an application for the gospel in our own lives here. I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. So as we think about a disciple who has a public witness, we first have to be a disciple who's been changed by Jesus ourselves. Right? If you've not understood that Jesus came as the light of the world to shine that light into the darkness of your life so that that sin can be exposed and that sin has been dealt with on the cross through his death, burial, and resurrection, we can have new life in Christ. That light that shines into our hearts through Jesus is the light that saves us, and then it's the light that we take out as we serve. I believe Paul talked about this in Colossians. Again, chapter 1, there's an interesting phrase that that Paul uses here. Because Jesus is talking about you're the light of the world. There's a commissioning here uh, for this public witness that he calls us to, to be people who shine light out. Colossians 1 is one of those great passages. Paul is talking about Jesus, the the preeminent one, uh, the image of the invisible God. He goes on and on and on. And then in, in verse 24, Paul begins to talk about his ministry. And he says this, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body. That is the church. So what Paul says, it's not that Jesus... His redemption is lacking in some way. Jesus, the redemption that he brings, is full and complete. But the work that is yet to be done in the world, there's still a lot to be done. There's still people, groups, and communities to be engaged with the gospel. So Paul is saying, I am completing in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's affliction for his body. That is the church. I've become its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. He's wanting to shine the light into the Gentile world, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. I labor for this, striving with his strength that works powerfully within me. We're called as people who bear this light to go out and work like Jesus did, to go out and work like Paul did. There is darkness that needs light to shine into it. There are still so many places where Jesus is not Lord, where Jesus is not glorified. And we take the light of the world to these places. And sometimes it's not easy. He makes a contrast here. He talks about a a city on a hill versus a a light that's hidden under a basket. Again, there's an absurdity in lighting a candle in a dark room and then covering it up. Uh, One is it would go out probably, right? Um, But it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. 
It just sits there and smolders. And God's not calling us to be believers who just sit and kind of smolder and smoke a little bit. He calls us to be like the city that's on the hill. That when you look up and you see that, there's something welcoming about that. I remember reading the story of Sir Ernest Shackleton, the the British explorer who tried to get down to the South Pole and he didn't make it and he's taking his guys and he's trying to get from the, the Antarctica back up to a place where they can be rescued. They finally get onto this island and they're, they're trying to get to the city and they, they top this snow-covered hill. They're exhausted and they can see this whaling station down on the other side and, and it's lit up. It talks about how they're in their spirits, everything changes, right? We want to be those people who are like the light that the city that's situated on a hill, it can't be hidden. A disciple, we are not called to merely have a private, personal holiness. Though, What we do when no one is looking certainly matters. So please hear me say that. But we're not just called to be people who are privately holy. Disciples are called to be a witness in the public arena. We are to shine like stars in the universe. Philippians 2. Great passage. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. Right? As you, you, you shine like stars in the universe, we go out holding forth the word of truth, the word of light. That's what we're called to. Write down 1 Peter chapter 2 here, verses 11 and 12. I want to read those. I think Peter says a very, very similar thing to Jesus here. Peter would have heard what Jesus said, right? He's there. I think Peter's repeating this to the people he's writing his letter to. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 says this, Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles so that when they slander you as evildoers, they will observe your good works And will glorify God on the day he visits. So he's calling these people who are being persecuted to live such good lives among those that are persecuting you that even though they slander you, they're saying you're an evildoer, they would see your good deeds. That's what Jesus says here in verse 16. The same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The character of the disciple impacts the effect of his witness. Guys, our character makes a difference in the way people hear and see our witness. We're to be people who have holiness and perseverance. People who have integrity and resilience as we live out our faith in the world. thinking about how to illustrate this public faith uh, and how at times it can be difficult. I think I've shared with you guys before, i got a neighbor that's scary. Uh, yeah, right? Everybody else got a neighbor that's scary a little bit. Uh, he's in the FBI. I told you about him, right? The black truck, the black trailer. I'm like, man, I wonder what's in that trailer. And then like, my kids come over, my boys, and we're like, oh, we're, we wonder what's in that trailer. Maybe we'll go over and sneak a peek, right? You, uh, there's no way I would do that. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm afraid. And, and if I'm not careful, if I'm not careful, I will be afraid to engage my neighbor with the gospel. I'll be intimidated, right? When I think about being a light that's shining on a hill, People see that. What what Jesus is saying here is don't be invisible, right? Don't be an invisible Christian. You cannot be an invisible witness. So I'm going to go old school here. Polycarp. 
This dude wasn't an invisible witness. Polycarp was a follower of Jesus, the bishop of Smyrna. Polycarp had become a Christian under the tutelage of John the Apostle. So the, the guy that walked with Jesus, the disciple that Jesus loved, wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, wrote Revelation. He, he sat next to Jesus and laid up against him at the Lord's Supper. Polycarp was discipled by that guy. Now, that's, that John, that disciple Polycarp, John heard Jesus teach Matthew 5, 13 through 16. I'm sure there were lots of, ask, lots of the Sermon on the Mount that he taught to Polycarp time and time and time again. And I'm sure that as Polycarp did the work that he was called to do in the early church, he thought about being salt of the earth. You talk about a difficult place to minister. The Roman Empire at that time, Nero, Marcus Aurelius. We love Gladiator, right? And all the, the cool stuff that we see with that. Those Roman emperors... They were rough, especially when it came to Christians in the Colosseum. Polycarp was in his 80s. He was sitting at a table, probably eating dinner. And Polycarp knew his life was in danger. A group of Christians had just been executed in the arena on account of their faith. But Polycarp refused to leave Rome. The Romans were executing any self-proclaimed Christians and pagans. The pagans were were betraying those they knew to be followers of the way. After the recent executions, the crowd in the arena had chanted specifically for Polycarp's death. The Roman proconsul had been looking for him for days. After arresting and torturing one of Polycarp's servants, they finally learned where he was staying. Soldiers went to the house... But instead of fleeing, Polycarp calmly stated, and history has been written this way. This isn't in the Bible, right? But this is what we, we have read from historical accounts. He says, God's will be done. Polycarp asked that food be brought for the soldiers, and he requested an hour for prayer. Amazed by Polycarp's fearlessness, especially for a man his age, the hardened Roman soldiers granted his request. He prayed for two hours. For all the Christians he knew and for the universal church. Soldiers then took him to the stadium. As Polycarp entered the stadium, several Christians present say that they heard a voice from heaven, Be strong, Polycarp. We don't know. Because of his age, the Roman proconsul gave Polycarp a final chance to live. He just had to swear by Caesar. And then say, take away these atheists. At the time, Christians were called atheists because they refused to worship Caesar as God. Polycarp would not do that. The proconsul continued, swear and I will let you go. Reproach Christ. Polycarp turned to the proconsul and boldly proclaimed, 86 years I have served him. And he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? The proconsul urged him again, saying, Swear by the fortune of Caesar. But Polycarp replied, Since you vainly think that I will swear by the fortune of Caesar, as you say, and pretend not to know who I am, listen carefully. I am a Christian. The proconsul threatened, I have wild beasts. I will throw you to them if you do not repent. Polycarp replied, call them, for we cannot repent from what is better to what is worse. But it is noble to turn from what is evil to what is righteous. The proconsul then threatened Polycarp with fire. Polycarp responded, You threaten me with a fire that burns an hour and is soon quenched. For you are arrogant of the fire of the coming judgment and eternal punishment stored up for the ungodly. But why do you delay? Do what you want. Finally, the proconsul sent a herald to the middle of the stadium to announce that Polycarp was confessing his faith as a Christian 
The crowd shouted for Philip the Asiarch to send a line against Polycarp, but he refused. Then they shouted for Polycarp to be burned. They moved him to the marketplace and prepared the pyre. Polycarp undressed, climbed up on the pyre, but when they were going to nail him to the pyre, he told them, leave me like this. He who gives me to endure the fire will also give me to remain on the pyre without your security from the nails. So they did not nail him, but they tied him up. And bravely, Polycarp prayed as the soldiers prepared the wood. Part of his prayer says, Lord, I bless you that you considered me worthy of this day and hour to receive a part in the number of the martyrs in the cup of your Christ. The Romans had threatened Polycarp with beasts and with fire, but nothing would make him turn against Christ. After his prayer, the men lit the fire, which sprang up quickly. History, the, what was written, tells us that the fire did not touch his body, but it formed an arc around him. Is that true? I don't know. But there is evidence that it could be. We just sang about it. I see about this, those three Hebrew boys that were thrown into the fire. Could you imagine being one of them? N knowing that you're going to die. And you get into the fire, and then you turn and look, and who's there with you? The Son of God. Saving you, protecting you. God had not abandoned those boys, and God hadn't abandoned Polycarp. The Romans didn't know what to make of this. In the end, the Romans commanded an executioner to stab him. A great quantity of blood put out from him, and it quenched the remaining fire, and Polycarp bled to death. Now, that's a rough story, but that's a good story. God probably will not call us to die like Polycarp died but we don't know that. But I know this. He has called us to live like Polycarp lived, right? To be salt of the earth. To be a benefit in the space that I'm filling up. Right? He's called me to have a public witness for Jesus the Son of God, who is the Savior of the world. And I pray, church, that we would do that well. Let me pray. God, we love you. God, we... I read this, and I know how much I struggle to be the witness that you've called me to. God, and I ask for your help in that. God, I don't want to be afraid. Uh, God, I want to be bold. God, I, I, don't, I don't want to be somebody that tears others down. I pray that you would help me be somebody that edifies and builds others up. God, I pray that for Mercy Village Church. God, that in, in Barbersville, West Virginia, there would be a light that shines on a hill, God, that there would be salt that flavors and preserves and blesses the community. God, I pray that for all of our churches. God, Huntington and Charleston and Cross Lanes, God, Beckley, Welch, West Virginia, God, Morgantown, Berkeley Springs, God, these places where you're at work, that we, your people, would be salt and light, and it would make a difference in the world. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Danny. As we move into a time of communion, we reflect on what we've heard. Um, brings a new, maybe, idea to being salty. <laughs> I kept thinking that. That's the pun I would have made if I was preaching. That's why I shouldn't be preaching all the time. Um, but also, it made me think of John Wesley. We good? 
made me think of John Wesley. Someone was talking to him one time about his preaching. People would come to to hear John Wesley preach, and he said, "They why? Like why?" And he, he said, uh, "I've been set on fire by the Lord, and people come to watch me burn." And again, Polycarp. That's that feels dramatic as we hear. We hear John Wesley say that feels dramatic, but but is that not what God? us to in our day-to-day lives that we would be people on fire with the realities of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and that as we live as those people in the world it'll make a relational difference and then it'll make a a gospel kingdom difference and I love what you prayed and I'm so thankful for that prayer at the end and I echo that with all my heart communion is a time to remember that when we fail to be salty, when we fail to be a light on the hill, that there is one who never fails, and that's Jesus, and he provided for us our righteousness on the cross through the finished work of of Jesus. And so we remember that through communion. Not only that, but we meet with Jesus at the table, the communion table, and we experience his presence and are reminded that he is right here, right now. So there'll be music that plays, the elements uh, gluten-free in the middle, Uh, And then the elements on the side as well. Take those, return to your seat, uh, and then we'll all partake of the meal together. If you are a Christian, this meal is for you. If you are not, simply observe or trust Jesus in this moment and and join us. Otherwise, uh, let this moment pass if you're not a Christian. Okay, we're going to read from Luke chapter 22. When the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying this cup is poured out for you, or this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. And we receive that freely today by the grace of God. We stand, please. We have our Mercy Village mantra. It is a reminder of who we are apart from the grace of God and a reminder all the more of who we are because of God's grace. We say this as we dismiss. My sin runs deep. God's grace runs deeper still. In Christ alone, anyone can get in on this. Go in peace. You're dismissed.